Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode number 80. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and today we're asking, why is there no inflation? A lot of people have been saying, we've got all this money printing, the Fed balance sheet has never been bigger. So will this lead to massive inflation? And a lot of people are saying, wait a second, why didn't it lead to massive inflation after 2008, 2009? Is the money printing, and I'm using air quotes, that much greater than what we saw in 2008? And yes and no. So for today, we'll talk a little bit about one of the ways you can, uh, something called money velocity, and running some studies there is a pretty good correlation between the velocity of money, and I'll explain that, uh, which includes the money supply and GDP, to uh, inflation. And we also have some lessons from Japan. Japan certainly had, uh, I mean, really a lot of quote-unquote money printing. Uh, the money supply expanded. But their their money velocity actually was was quite low and you would expect that because they didn't have a lot of inflation. In fact, they've had periods of deflation. So why no inflation? And what should you watch to see if maybe we will have some inflation? And then where has all this money supply gone? In other words, if it's not causing massive inflation, what is it causing? So uh, first, a couple of things. Uh, money velocity, what is it? Okay. So let's sort of simplify things. Let's say somebody goes into, I don't know, a, a pizza store, pizza store, pizza shop, and spends a dollar for a slice of pizza. And I know nowadays pizza is probably much more than that, but let's go with a dollar because it's nice and easy to understand. So you go into the pizza shop, you hand over your dollar, you get a nice tasty slice of pizza. The pizza owner says, fantastic, um, because he or she wants to go buy a $1 cup of coffee. So you give the the fine person the the pizza store your dollar, get your slice, you walk away happy. The owner then goes to the coffee shop, buys a $1 cup of coffee. The coffee shop owner is thrilled because they now uh, were hungry for a candy bar and they can go to the candy store and buy a dollar, uh, put down a dollar and get a candy bar. And then that candy store owner says, you know what, I was wanting to get the Sunday paper, and goes to the newsstand and buys that paper for a dollar. So when you think about the velocity of money and how do you figure that out, well, that same dollar was used four different times. And, you know, the quick calculation on the velocity of money is it is uh, the nominal GDP, which measures the, the, uh, you know, the value of all the final goods So your pizza slice, your cup of coffee, your candy bar, your newspaper. Uh, So imagine GDP is $4. You had no imports, exports. And that was all there was in the economy. And then you divide that by the money supply. Here we have this $1 bill. Imagine that's the only dollar that's that's in circulation. And so your money velocity would be four. But you kind of get the idea. It's how often or how quickly does a single dollar change hands, okay? And the theory is, the you know, the faster you have that same dollar changing hands, uh, the more a little bit of money is chasing, you know, goods around. And it's worth noting, too, that this is a good example, too, of how, you know, money as a medium of exchange helps the, the flow of goods and services. In other words, imagine this pizza owner is like, hey, I really want a cup of coffee, he says to the the owner of the coffee shop, um, I'll trade you a slice of pizza for a cup of coffee. And the, the owner says, well, I don't drink coffee or I already had some, I don't want some. And otherwise, you know, the pizza owner would have to go around and say, well, let me find something that the owner does want. So maybe the, the owner of the coffee shop would like uh, a candy bar. So the pizza owner would have to go to the, the candy bar store and say, hey, do you... Uh, do you want to trade a slice of pizza for a candy bar? And the person says, sure. So then you take the candy bar back to the coffee shop and you exchange the candy bar for, for a cup of coffee. Uh, mon- you know, Money is a medium exchange, makes that whole process because you don't actually have to trade goods. But the reality is that 
you know, the, the money is um, a source of value. It's really a medium of exchange. Uh, the goods that are produced, um, you know, and what sort of drives the economy is, is really all these little pieces all over the, the world that are, you know, sourcing goods, uh, turning them into finished products and, and sort of moving around like that. But money velocity is just, like I said, how, how often that, uh, that same $1 changes hands. Okay, hold on to that thought. We're going we're gonna to come back to that when we think about how this all relates to inflation. The second thing we have to look at is what's called the money supply. And you've heard about the Fed is printing money, the Fed balance sheet. So there's a couple different ways to measure the money supply. Uh, there's M1, M2, and then... You know, a lot of, uh, it seems like the Federal Reserve uh, or a lot of people like to, to do what's called the MZM. MZM is, you know, the Z stands for zero maturity. So zero maturity just is a fancy way for saying what's, what's really liquid. And so that's your currency. That's, uh, you know, checking money that's in checking accounts. That's money markets. Um, might not necessarily mean, you know, CDs that are wrapped up, you know, with a five year. It's, it's things you could easily get access to and use right away. All right. Um, also, I guess traveler's checks, but does anybody even use traveler's checks anymore? Money, some of you might not even know what those are. It used to be if you were tr- going to go traveling, you would go to like an American Express store and say, here's a hundred dollars. Um, can I have this hundred dollar US, you know, this traveler's check, which was the same as cash. But let's say you got robbed at at a metro station in in Europe, you in theory could call American Express and put a hold on on the traveler check. Anyway, Google it if you don't know what those are. I don't know if anybody uses any anymore though. Okay. So the money supply though, and money supply is just a way of saying how much money is, you know, in the economy that's liquid. Um, Now, this does not include, let's say, money that's in, you know, stocks, uh, money that's in a house. So think about this as as the stuff that's liquid. So one of the the way that you figure the the velocity of money is, remember the quick uh, back of the envelope is, you take the nominal GDP, which is basically the economy. It's what, you know, everything that's being uh, sold in the economy or transacted in the economy, it's the value of the finished goods. So if I bought a baseball hat uh, for $20, that $20 sale uh, would be reflected in GDP. The, the cardboard, the fabric, you know, the button on top of the hat, all of those things are part of the production cycle of that hat but they're not finished goods. They're intermediate goods and they are not counted in GDP per se. All right. So to give you an idea of the growth of the money supply, and I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Professor Jeremy Siegel, his thought was that with the stimulus and the checks and the PPP loans and, you know, whatever else is, is going on, all the stimulus is adding to the money supply. And he is not wrong. Uh, in fact, from, I think from the end of February to the third week of July, the money supply measured by MZM is up about 25%. Uh, to give you some numbers on this, at the end in Q4 of 19, it was about $16.8 trillion. Uh, at the end of Q2 of 20, so that's June 30, 30th or 31st, 30th, right? Uh, 20 trillion, 20.4 trillion. And then as of right around July 23rd, it was a little bit over $21 trillion. And so in a very short amount of time, and this is one of those things, people have been quite surprised just the magnitude and the speed at which the Fed acted. But the money supply has grown about 25% in a very short amount of time. And people look at that and they say, when you add this much money, you print this much money, it's bound to lead to inflation. But will it? Um, By the way, to put this in perspective too, we had some money printing, you know, in uh, in 2008 too. 
And I just went and looked. And the start, so January 1st of 2008 through the middle of 2009, uh, it, it went up about 19%. And is that the right period to look at? Probably not, because we really didn't start to accelerate things in 2008 until... You know, well, I guess I guess we had some of the drawdowns, but the, the the final drawdown was in the fall of 2008, and then certainly the the first quarter of 2009. So, the speed of this increase in the money supply is, in my opinion, unprecedented. But um, on a percentage basis, you know, you could make an argument it's it's marginally. I shouldn't say marginally. It's it's higher than 2008. And it's worth noting that we really didn't have any inflation from 2008, 2009. In fact, we've had very low inflation, very low interest rates during that entire time. In fact, interest rates have now back down to zero. So what is this relationship of the money supply and GDP and money velocity? And what can it tell us about potential for inflation? Well, one of the ways that I did this is I pulled, and I'll link to this, um, the St. Louis Reserve Bank, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, sorry, has a lot of free data and charts on their site. And one of the things I did was I went and I said, I'm going to pull, and I could go back to 1960. So, you know, the problem is you can't, I mean, granted, we didn't have a central bank in the U.S. until the early um, 1900s. But I can only I can only pull it from 1960. Maybe somebody else can pull it from back prior to that. But what I did was I looked at the the rate of inflation, and that's the consumer price index. And then I looked at the velocity of MZM, uh, the near money or the the zero maturity money. Okay, there's also M1 and M2, um, but I'm I'm using the MZM. Okay, so what I did was I ran what's called a regression. Uh, analysis and and I plotted a graph. Uh, if I put this on the website, I will uh, I'll go back and put a link to it. It's not going to be there right away though. So you might have to come back to the episode to the show notes. But one of the things you see is that, you know, for example, we had really high inflation in late 70s, early 80s. Um, the velocity of money was was fairly high. Um, and for example, um, I don't know exactly what year this is, uh, but you know we had inflation of around 11% and the velocity of money was a little over 3%. We had money velocity of 3.5%. I'm sorry, 3.5%. And, um, and inflation was over 10%. So have you ever seen, if you can imagine this, uh, if you're looking at a, a chart with a bunch of dots that represent the annual levels of inflation, and the velocity of money, um, there is there's a correlation. And as the velocity of money comes down, on the left side of the axis is inflation. On the bottom is your money velocity. You know, when you've got velocity of money of let's say one and a half or less um, on an annualized inflation, you don't see inflation higher than you know two and a quarter, two and a half, and so. What we have is this uh, this sloping reg- regression line, um, and it's sloping down and to the left, which means there's a correlation. Uh, how much of the correlation? Well, one of the ways we do that is we use what's called an R square. And don't worry, I'm not going to bury you with a bunch of statistic stuff. But this has an R square of about you know 51 or 51 percent. And what that says is when things are absolutely perfectly correlated, you know you would have an R square close to 100. There's not as much of a stronger relationship or, or a, um, you know, one is dependent upon the other or the relationship isn't as stable. You'd expect to see, you know, R square very low. This one's about, you know, midway there. Um, but the point is that what we see is that the lower the velocity of money, uh, the lower probability of inflation, at least using annual historical numbers going back to 1960. Now, it is interesting that the lowest measure that I found of money velocity uh, was about 1.31. And again, last 10 years, the velocity of money has been going down and down and down. You'll see this when I link to the chart. Um, And so looking at this more recently, uh, 
the velocity of money in the last quarter actually dipped below one, okay? So to put this into perspective, using my, you know, my quick analysis and, you know, it's not ready for publication or anything like that, um, a velocity of 1.16 on your x-axis using, you know, the the formula on uh, on the regression should get about a you know around a zero percent expected inflation rate. So that is uh, that kind of tells you something. And in Q two at the end of Q two, the velocity of money actually was zero point nine four nine. Okay, let's bring it back to the practical. It's the whole idea that in theory, when you have higher money velocity, that's more likely to produce higher levels of inflation. When you have lower velocity of money, you would expect lower levels of inflation or or a lower probability of seeing inflation. And so even though we've had all of this money printing, we actually haven't seen inflation, uh, certainly since 2008. And remember the formula, it's your your nominal GDP divided by your Nominal GDP divided by your money supply. So if GDP goes below the value of the money supply, the MZM money supply, you're going to have less than one money velocity. And of course, when we had the contraction in GDP for Q2, uh, well, we know that there's $21 trillion in the MZM money supply right now. Uh, GDP at the end of Q2 was only $19.4 trillion down from the high at the end of uh, you know 2019 of 21.7 trillion. So for this to go back above one, you would either need to hold constant, uh, you need to hold constant in, in your MZM money supply and have GDP go back above that and grow. Um, but anyway, I think it's an intuitive. And if you want to follow this, again, the Fred, uh, you Google Fred uh, MZM, Money velocity, or I'll just put the I'll put all the links into the into the show notes. But a lot of people said, "How can we have all this printing?" So the question is, though, where if we're printing all this money and it's not necessarily causing inflation, where is it going? And a lot of theories, uh, more than theories, say, "Look, um, what's not measured in CPI, the Consumer Price Index?" Well, it's not measured, of course, is stock prices, asset prices. You know, those are not uh, measured in regard to the, the rate of change in consumer prices. And so if you've got the Fed expanding its balance sheet or you have an increase in the money supply and that winds up funding asset purchases, uh, that's not going to show in your normal CPI. Now, uh, a lot of people say, look, the CPI is flawed. And the arguments for that are, I've, you know, let's say you've been paying tuition or buying books or you go to the grocery store or any number of things. And you're like, hey, I, I see more in, than zero inflation. I see more than, you know, one to 2% inflation like we've been seeing over the past decade. And that's that's entirely possible. Uh, in fact, I would more than likely um, there's alternative measures to inflation. Uh, the Shadow Stats runs, uh, you can Google them. Uh, they run some alternative models. And there's another, is it Chatwood? Chartwood, Chatwood. I'll, I'll find it and I'll link it into the notes. Uh, what they do is they just follow some of the most commonly bought items for consumers and they follow the prices for those. And I think they've said, no, we haven't been looking at, you know, one to 2% inflation, we've been more like seven to 10%. And look, inflation's also could sometimes be narrow. Uh, If you don't have, if you're not, say, taking college courses or paying for somebody's college courses, you might not experience the inflation that we've seen in the price of higher education. Of course, we've had unlimited loans from the government, which also feeds into that. Uh, That's another podcast altogether. Uh, But if you're not buying textbooks, you know, you might not do that. Uh, if eggs are going up 100% year over year, but you never buy eggs, you wouldn't experience that. So uh, inflation can also be low, you know, very, very specific. Um, 
But I think this really shows that, uh, remember our example, our original example, uh, we're not seeing the speed or the velocity of money increase. We've seen it go down uh, since 2008, 2009. Uh, and in fact, it's below one. And so the theory says, and you know, just doing some quick math amongst us here, we would say until we see the velocity of money go higher, in theory, we shouldn't necessarily expect the CPI to make any great uh, gains. And so if you want to follow this, I'll give you the links. Uh, it's also worth noting, I mentioned Japan. I think I mentioned Japan earlier. You know, Japan, uh, their Nikkei stock exchange peaked in the 1980s. And unlike the NASDAQ or the S&P 500 or the Russell or the Dow Jones, who have all made, you know, higher highs than uh, they had prior to the 2008-2009 crisis, uh, Japan has never gone above their 1980s, uh, the highs reached the 1980s. And part of the reason why, um, well, there's a number of reasons, but they certainly have uh, prints a lot of money. Their velocity of money was below one for uh, quite a while. They saw periods of deflation. Um, and you know their government or, or their their you know Federal Reserve equivalent, the Bank of Japan, uh, has been buying uh, assets, uh, even buying exchange traded funds and things like that. Um, and the Fed recently, in the past couple months, has started doing that. We've seen that they've been buying individual bonds. We've seen them buying uh, bond ETFs. And so, uh, but the the lesson from Japan is. Um, you would have expected, or a lot of people might have thought, that uh, adding all, adding a bunch of money to the money supply would cause hyperinflation. Uh, but in fact, we haven't seen that. We didn't see that in Japan. We saw deflation. Um, and it also begs the question of whether negative rates, uh, how, and there's some mixed feelings on negative interest rates. Uh, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. has not gone to negative interest rates, but of course we know uh, the European Union, Switzerland, Japan, a uh, number of different countries do have negative rates. And the theory is if you make rates negative, then it sort of forces uh, you know, banks or, or people to, to spend money. Uh, but in fact, uh, we've seen some of the, we haven't seen that cause inflation. Uh, we have not seen negative rates cause inflation. So um, it's, it's sort of the jury's still out on that. Um, now, the market rate for, let's say, U.S. Treasuries, uh, the Federal Reserve does have impact on the front end of the curve, meaning the, the nearer maturities. And we saw in the height of the crisis this year, uh, I believe it was the six-month, one-year, uh, there were some durations of U.S. Treasuries. You know, the market rate of interest went negative for a brief amount of time. We know that uh, the five-year the other day hit 19 basis points, 0 0.19. The 10-year is just over 50 uh, basis points, so a little over half a percent. Um, but anyway, we'll. Uh, I'm going to link to a lot of this stuff. Remember, follow if you want to follow and, and get an idea of the relationship between the velocity of money and inflation. I encourage you to take a look at those uh, uh, those graphs that I'll link to, and. This may help, you know, when everyone is talking and saying, oh, we're going to have, you know, massive inflation. By the way, we might still. Uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, but uh, this will give you some talking points because money printing alone doesn't necessarily cause inflation. Uh, it doesn't necessarily create money. And, you know, depending upon where the money goes, um, you know, I think Arguably, you would say that a lot of it went to asset prices. Is there inflation in asset prices? Yeah, there might be. All right, folks, um, we'll leave it there. Remember, please share this with someone who might enjoy it uh, or even someone who doesn't enjoy it. Maybe maybe they'll just enjoy it anyway, even if they don't think they will. And of course, you can always reach out to me with ideas for the show, for future episodes. Love to hear from the listeners. And uh, if you have a second uh you know, rather than asking you to rate and review and give me five stars. Um, podcasts are growing in popularity, but of course, uh, you may know someone who hasn't. And with all these lockdowns and, uh, you know, not a lot of new shows or movies and stuff, uh, 
now would be the, a great time to uh, pass along to uh, to friends and uh, co-workers or whatever. So, all right, folks, we'll see you again next week.